It would be nice to be able to forget about a time when the conversation about politics on the internet was being had by people on Reddit who liked Ron Paul and people who read Vice and liked Lena Dunham. There was more nuance than that, but the past is usually remembered as a composition of its most garish exports by non-historians like us. This era had a literary movement, which is dead enough for me to reflect on, while being pretty certain that there won't be any serious new developments, which make me look like an asshole later. The market for literature in the late 2000s was bleak. You could either be 50 and white and write middle brow bullshit, or work at a magazine or website with other nobody graduates. There was an audience for younger authors which wasn't realized by the publishing houses who totally neglected what was happening online. Thus, Alt-Lit was a fitting title for a movement which was an alternative to what was happening at Boring Ass Penguin. Like, getting published on a blog like Electric Serial or Moo Moo House would expose your writing to a large and young audience who was willing to buy a book if you wrote one or come and see you read live. The authors who wrote for these blogs were fun to follow. Finding their long literary Amazon reviews and hearing about their pranks to get noticed by the larger online media. Alt-lit authors also had an alternative literary lifestyle, going to parties where no one says anything, taking meaningful walks at night, doing drugs and watching art films, being in cold relationships, chatting on Gmail, working a part-time job. Their experiences were documented in their writing. Most alt-lit is this kind of thing. Poems about unspectacular sex on Adderall which leads to a minor argument. There are issues which arise from this style of writing. Reflecting on the few dozen important books written before the movement was stomped out can feel like someone has taken a series of diary entries from the Gilded Age, made a few proper nouns more contemporary and the prose more droll to fuck around. Open up your nearby copy of Against Nature, have a nodded avant teen who hates you edit it, and you're set. There's a nauseating current of parental backing of the exploits we're reading, which possibly explains how the authors are able to major in English comp at expensive New York schools without worrying about the earning potential of their degree. Sad rich kids are hard to empathize with, and in 2009 when the movement was most active, stories about waking up at noon to a check from dad to pay for a broken MacBook screen now read as shockingly unself-aware. And a good case for why, along with saying the n-word into a cheap headset and minion memes, alt-lit will be seen as a sacred object of cringe in a few years. Alt-lit had a short life because of abuse within the movement, particularly horrific accusations about the head figure who published everyone else made the thing somehow even less sympathetic, and that was pretty much it. And now its gnarly carcass is left for us to play doctor with to try and possibly learn something from. Post-irony is when you've been an insincere dickhead for so long that you can no longer express yourself in a normal way. Your sincere and ironic expressions are melded so that your method of communication becomes totally inefficient and foreign to all but your friends with a similar affliction. This is the voice Alt-Lit is written in. I would describe it as an experience where the only hint you have that what you're reading isn't entirely a joke is because it's not making you laugh. It's sort of an attempt to be compassionate like David Foster Wallace, but by people who will still dismiss you with a tranquilized and confusing tongue lashing if you let some weakness show. This is the voice of author Tao Lin, who likes Stephen Roggenbuck, Stephen Tully Derrick, and Stephen Michael McDowell is a sexual predator. Lin was having sex with a 16-year-old when he was 22 and he made him stay under 125 pounds, write his failures as a lover, and wear a dress in order to smother his attempts to express his gender dysphoria. And he also just stole his writing for a commercial work. Lin tortured this person, and most of the movement defended him. He hardly apologized to his victim even though he acknowledges most of the accusations, and he took action against Gawker, which is usually commendable, but in this instance it was to try and get an article in Jezebel, which catalogued his admitted crimes taken off the site. 
Lin is the focus of this video. Really, I just talk about him and Megan Boyle, another author who writes like Tao Lin, or vice versa if you prefer, and they both write like every one of their peers. Uh, I guess I should bother proving this. Here's something Lin wrote. <laughs> In Paul's room, Laura tried to identify some of his 15 to 20 pills and tablets, mostly from Charles, who had mailed them before leaving for Mexico with her phone, but the internet wasn't working. Paul's MacBook, which he'd spilled iced coffee on, was in Kansas being affordably repaired. Laura swallowed two of them of what Paul knew was Tylenol 3. Paul swallowed a Percocet, and somewhat arbitrarily he felt three Advil, then turned off the light, saying it was hurting his headache. I feel a sharp pain in my stomach. I become suddenly unable to discern the difference between anxiety and excitement and hunger pains. I put my hair in a bun. I tear a hole in my tights and use my thumb and forefinger to then remove my tights and put them in my purse. I call David. His phone rings three times and then goes to voicemail. <laughs> Eight three packets of Gushers and two packets of Scooby-Doo gummies still seem to feel the sugar on my teeth. I'm squirming. My legs feel like enormous and tingly. A blowjob will be good right now. This is time for a blowjob, I think, as I squint my eyes at the screen and feel nauseous. <laughs> Got on the L train at 8th Avenue. I noticed that a black woman didn't get off on the 8th Avenue bound L train. She stayed on it. As it became a Brooklyn bound L train, I saw her sitting across from me. Later, I didn't see her. Later, she was sitting next to me. She asked, can I ask you a question? She, she said, can I ask you a question? She said, what is, what book is that? She said, what book is that? I was reading Honored Guest by Joy Williams. I said, Honored Guest by Joy Williams, quietly, and showed her the cover of the book. She said, what? I said the same thing louder and showed her the cover of the book for a longer period of time. She said something like, can you read fast? I said, yes. I just closed my eyes and allowed my head to roll back, hitting the wall. Twelve forty-seven p.m. Woke. Drank leftover Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Ate maybe five milligrams Adderall. Pooped. Moved bed to look for missing e-cigarette and crack between bed and wall where phone fell. Didn't see. Swept floor. Read texts from last night. Found e-cigarette. Have been avoiding updating due to spending large portion of my time doing a thing I want to omit from live blog, which I want to write about. But if people know about there could be negative consequences for me or another person. Have thought a lot about this. Imagining consequences. The thing I'm omitting is making me happier. Deliberately avoiding talking about it is why I want to omit this new thing for live blog to exclude something to the degree I plan on excluding it that's good I think it's it I think in that it's new 127 126 p.m. ate half a concerta unsure milligram going to update this with everything I remember from May June May 31st to June 2nd from the perspective of no longer Saturday June 3rd afternoon Saturday June 8th afternoon option that won the most votes on poll, then I'm going to update everything I remember from June 4th, written about now. I was getting nowhere for a while, and then I turned 33. I met G, a handsome drama student at the bar in Almenta, and I started to feel that I was really getting somewhere. However, slowly he told me that he was 28, but my friends insisted that he was 23 or 24 at the most. But it made no difference to me because he was young and handsome. I liked him days past and he kept sending me emails, text messages, whatsapps, and DMs. My friend told me not to hook up with him because he was very young, just a boy. Besides, he might have a girlfriend. I asked him point blank one afternoon when we went out for a mint-flavored coffee at the corner of Circe and Manuel Mont. G said, no, I don't have a girlfriend. How about you? That same night, I took him back to my place. We ate and we fucked. And then he saw me naked. He said, hey, you have to work out a bit harder. You have to work out every day, once or twice a day, if possible. I believed him. He offered to be my instructor, and we started working out. Some things happened. Then other things happened, followed by some other things. I forgot about some things, but I remember that from the start, I was afraid he would move out if it did. If I didn't work Can out you imagine enough. reading an entire book with this shit? Can you imagine reading an entire book filled with this shit? I've chosen to focus on Lin because he's really the defining figure of the movement. 
the owner of the publisher Moo Moo House, which every major alt-lit author has contributed to and which Lena Dunham's character in Girls works at, which is so lame. Lynn is also probably the best alt-lit author, in my opinion, besides Noah Cicero, who I've chosen not to read an excerpt from because his writing is actually interesting, so it wouldn't uh, fit the pattern that I'm trying to create in your mind. I've actually read Lynn's most important novel, Taipei, which has a blurb on the cover from Publishers Weekly, which applauds the author for capturing the sleepwalking malaise of millennials. It's understandable that a boomer like whoever wrote this blurb could mistake the book as an expression of the confounding generation responsible for the abolition of brunch. We follow an author stand-in named Paul, from his bedroom to live readings and back again. He doesn't get much of anything done, which never seems to have consequences. Skeletal prose describe the absolutely mundane which you'll find everywhere in alt-lit. Is it an autistic... <laughs> Is it an artistic accomplishment, at least an uncompromised, to depict yourself exactly as you are if you're a shitty little person? Maybe. But when I've encountered people like Lynn in my life, I've never been eager to, I've never been eager to learn why they're so sullen. Alt-Lit represents a whole bunch of those people telling you that you probably wonder why they're so disaffected, and neither you nor anyone else other than similarly boring cunts want to find out why. I mean, how about a literary movement made up of the guys at bars who touch your shoulder in apology when they bump into you or kids who found a snake in their garden? I can name 100 types of people whose experience I'd rather understand before I reached the quiet, sad, rich rapist on Adderall. And is Lynn really representative of his age group like this person claims? No, absolutely not. Nick Hornsby wasn't representative of his age group either. If you were to take the qualities which are most common among Lynn's age group when he was popular, you would have someone going to a shitty college, living either at home or in a shitty place, working a terrible exploitative job, and spending their remaining time getting drunk and getting laid once yearly. The author of this blurb confuses Lynn's malaise from a weird one-night stand with someone he might like with that of our common man which comes from the realization that he will spend the rest of his life in wage slavery. You will never read a novel by this person, and it's rare to see one from their perspective widely read entirely because it's depressing. They are written, though. Lynn and the rest of the gang represent a marketable, sexy, tiny minority of their age group. The new heroine chic. This is why their prose can be so mundane. Remember that diary entry from Megan? Here's a version from someone uh, in a justifiable malaise. 8.14 p.m. Dad got home from his job as a janitor with dinner. 40 chicken nuggets for my sister and I. I took mine back to my room to eat while I play CSGO. 11.13 p.m. Masturbated on a figurine. About to get into bed and pretend I'm cuddling an androgynous cat boy and drift to sleep. And perhaps when it was published a few years ago, the average young person was generally aloof for whatever reason, but I, you can't really say that now. There are the pop nihilist shitheads, but most young people now are furious and terrified. Has Taipei already aged poorly after five years, or did the author of this blurb not know anything about youth culture? Well, I want them both to be true, so I won't pick either. Let's be a good literary critic and talk about the cover. I was coerced by tricksters on a Bulgarian circuit-bending bulletin into purchasing Taipei, so a physical copy of the book sits on my shelf, which sometimes seems strange to me. The cover and spine have this reflective glitter material, spelling out the name and author. It's about the most literal and cheap way possible to attract readers, by glowing when light is directed towards it. It fits that aesthetic of driver, enter the void, Gesefelstein, this glistening two-tone which is muted with bad vibes. A few years earlier when the aesthetic was Odd Future, MGMT, Adventure Time, whatever, Lynn's books looked like this. Neither cover is totally cliché, but it's interesting to me that a literary voice which has been the same for 10 years can be marketed in different ways without striking me as inappropriate in either case. Is there another author who you can think of who matches the 2008 aesthetic of wearing a dozen patterns, riding one of those spring rides on a playground, quietly roaring and trying to figure out a relationship, and without changing his writing also fits the 2012 aesthetic of taking Molly and leaning against the wall in a club waiting for an explosion of violence in a members-only jacket? 
Lynn might be the most marketable writer of all time because of this, and I think you could make a good case that he's the nameless protagonist of literature. Okay, we can move beyond the cover. Only a few things happen in Taipei which add to a greater narrative. There are probably five events which cause the narrative to change, and the narrative is just a retelling of Lin's own life experiences for a, like a two or three year period. And everyone in his life is identical, so for example when he starts dating a new girl there's not really anything new to chew on. It's just really a new white name we attribute to expressions like I'm sort of hungry and I might go to bed or do some work on my MacBook. It has this depressed slacker aesthetic, which I have no problem with in theory. If the sessions of Paul, uh, the protagonist, wandering around and hanging out were interesting in themselves. The failure of these many scenes, I feel, justifies my focus on Lynn as a person. These moments where Lynn's character is doing nothing are shitty because Lynn is a boring asshole who isn't fun to be around, except when he's publishing you. He is definitely superior to his peers, though. He does have some interesting and funny little thoughts occasionally. Paul realized a poster said chicken rings and not onion rings, and it seemed, quote, insane, and speculated on the process that must be required of making meat into a paste to mold into rings. It would be wrong to reduce Tao to the level of one of his friends. Firstly, because I'm sure most of his friends are just creepy in a non-criminal way, and also because Tao can construct interesting sentences. But it's all just wasted. It's like being able to piss with a really interesting, compelling arc into a swamp. And now he writes fucking Eerowid trip reports. Whatever. The book starts with Tao's stand-in, Paul, breaking up with some girl. Then he makes a friend and starts dating another girl. He loses touch with his friend and then takes his girlfriend to Thailand to visit his parents. And then they return home. In between these events, we're exposed to a repetition which might actually reflect a real-life tally Lin took of his daily habits. He checks his Gmail, he has brief conversations on Gchat, does undefined things on his MacBook. These activities happen so many dozens of times that I think their inclusion might be an inside joke. Like how the characters in another novel by him are named Dakota Fanning and Haley Joel Osment, haha. <laughs> The rest of the time we follow Paul, he's having brief conversations with his roommates, going to stores, standing around, attending parties, and sometimes pulling weird pranks like pretending that he writes for Jezebel and asking people questions with his girlfriend. At one point he goes on a reading tour to interact with the same people he could have met at home. He also does drugs sometimes. The descriptions of taking acid, MDMA, Adderall, uh, I think that's all, I think he just does those three as you would imagine, are very boring. Most of the time he's on drugs, we're getting status updates about how he feels in his feet. It's usually that they feel weird. Lin interacting with his dealers is also dreadful. It's presented as if someone like Lin being in a dealer's car is inherently comedic because, you know, he's an NYU grad. Meanwhile, the most absurd moments in the book when Lin and company go to meet Caleb, Lin's rich 16-year-old benefactor whose father is owns a steak processing plant. Things are played pretty straight. When I first read Taipei and was very quickly bored, I remember trying to see how quickly I could get through the book while still taking everything in. And I don't think I found the limit, but rather I was starting to get a headache. Still, I finished the book in two hours and felt the emotional burden of a skippable YouTube ad when I had finished. After that, I considered alt-lit as a sort of clever scheme. Like how Patrice Wilson could turn any rich white girl into a pop star. The people at these alt-lit journals could turn any rich kid into a writer with their own commemorative physical book to show for it. Almost like the very probable conspiracy that modern art is partially a money laundering scheme, rich kids in the alt-lit scene moved around social capital enough among the authors like Lynn, the journalists before they turned on them, and the third parties like Caleb who set up readings until they had created a, a literary movement. As if casting a spell or creating a sarcophagus around the air and then assuming that it housed a king once it was constructed. This theory was aided by alt-lit authors literally starting to publish their tweets. Another conspiracy I have is that alt-lit is an entrepreneurial capitalist way of taking advantage of the read-anything mentality. 
the cultural idea that anything read is better than anything watched, confirmed by these library posters of celebs imploring students simply to read. These suggest that someone could transcribe their oxymoronically dull debauchery and grocery lists, publish them, and reach an audience not completely dissimilar to the kids who read those Halo books while pretending to be real writers with only the evidence of their misery, which, once again, the blurbs can easily mistake for the misery of the working-class subject. Look, I don't want you guys to think that I am automatically against simple or minimalistic literature like Lynn's because it doesn't excite my caveman brain sufficiently. I like minimalistic literature, but I can defend any minimalistic book or passage that I've enjoyed with a sturdier defense than this is just what the author is like, he's a boring asshole. Here, let's compare some passages from alt-lit to some lit. Here's a passage from Skylark. Aiko suddenly picked up the tumbler of snops they had set before him and downed it in one. The alcohol warmed its way through his body and lifted him to his feet. There was an enormous knocking in his old brain, and he felt such delight that he wouldn't have mind the least if there and then, in this moment of giddy ecstasy, when he felt his whole being, his whole life, was in his grasp. He were to fall down and die on the spot. This is a simple but beautiful piece of prose. It's not a psychologically complicated passage. The guy is so fucked up he wouldn't mind dying. But all of the additional descriptive language is used to make the feeling of the character more vivid to us. And this simple event matters in the grander narrative. Like Lin checking his computer in Taipei, there's a lot of drinking in Skylark. Drinking is not an inherently more interesting activity than checking your MacBook, necessarily. This moment is the last time the character is that drunk, and it's sort of a crescendo to being fucked up. The highest high achievable with liquor. A height sought after since the beginning of the book when the character reunited with his drinking buddies. Each scene with drink distinguishes itself. This final scene with it makes us recall a similar height the character and his wife experience from seeing a powerful play. Each activity, no matter how mundane, has an important place in the narrative of Skylark. The characters have been shut off to the joys of life, and we see them gradually embrace new experiences when their daughter leaves to visit an uncle. There's no action which has any more meaning the first time Talon Stanton does it than the last time he does it. There are remarkable passages in Taipei where Paul is so disengaged that it seems impossible for Lin to really be like this. These must be failures at representation, at portraying a realistic, experienceable level of indifference. I hope these are failures, but rich kids will always surprise you with how little humanity they can get by with. Okay, let's look at a passage from Taipei and compare it with Skylark. Paul was at Bob's library around 3.30 p.m. and had just ingested a capsule of MDMA when Erin texted that she was about 50 minutes away. Paul walked 10 blocks to the bookstore and sat on a tiny bench in the fiction section and tweeted and looked at his Gmail account. Erin texted that she was in the store and had eaten a chocolate. Paul was surprised she was with a male friend whom she introduced as a former co-worker named Gary who lived in Brooklyn. He's gay, said Aaron, and gave Paul a chocolate, which he chewed into a gluey paste and swallowed with lemon water from the bookstore cafe. After the reading, Paul, Aaron, and Gary walked to a bar for someone's 33rd birthday. Gary left after around 10 minutes, and Aaron said he had whispered in her ear that he had felt sad and wanted to talk. I told him I couldn't now, I'm on mushrooms, said Aaron. Then he asked me for mushrooms. I said, I don't have any, and he probably and he probably shouldn't have them now anyway, and I'd call him tomorrow. This character Gary is never heard from again, and his appearance represents nothing. None of the activities in this paragraph do anything other than add to a counter. Plus one drugs consumed, plus one parties attended, plus one Gmail checked. A Tao Lin fan will tell you that the insignificance of these encounters is a stylistic way of depicting that malaise we heard about before. 
But what purpose is there in reiterating this so many fucking times or so few times? You could you could cut Thai pay in half or triple it and have the same experience, which to me invalidates it completely. The latest document from the Altlet movement is Megan Boyle's live blog, which is also the first Altlet I've heard about in a long time. The concept is that this rich white girl wrote down all the events in her life for a few years. That's it. This is hopefully the last utterance of low-effort narcissism from the crew, and I suspect it is. 500 pages of checking MacBooks, hanging out, and getting money from Dad. That's not a joke, either. This is lifestyle writing that will make you miss lifestyle writing when it was about a guy in a button-up shirt manipulating women to fuck him. The millennial lifestyle fantasized about through literature is one where, when your depression demands you stay in bed, you can obey it. Don't tell me this is meant to be relatable. Relatable shit is augmented with humor or prose. If you want the relatable version of this, look to Meg, Mog, and Owl. Lifestyle, lifestyle fantasy can be pretty literal, and sometimes it is just a perked up document of reality. Anselm Jap explains this miserable condition with the only thing at stake in economic competition is a more comfortable place within the general alienation. Live blog is 500 pages of Instagram photos described by a very lucky depressive. The aesthetic is slightly different from the usual fantasy blog of jacked men and tiny women on a boat flexing with the merchandise but only because it's directed at an audience who fancies themselves too discerning for that sort of nonsense while still needing the fix. Megan works at home but doesn't sell a program, so you can too. She's young and has a lot of hot friends, but they're all bundled up in black sweaters. She lives a lifestyle desired by most living people, but hates it, which might be the central source of distaste from Altlit. What's worth celebrating is that these shitheads only circulate each other's writing now. The Amazon page for LiveBlog has one review as of writing this, and it's written by Tao Lin. There are reasons why the patrons of this writing have disappeared, and it goes beyond the sexual abuse. Being a disaffected, ironic, white, rich kid in the modern world is thankfully an unenviable position. People began to ask why snarky intern Lena Dunham doesn't know a black person and why she keeps gay men as accessories, why she had become the mascot for millennial leftism when she comes from a rich home, is white, cis, heterosexual, etc., and isn't really interested in associating with anyone outside that demographic. People wondered if performative irony, which confuses and annoys everyone and being high all the time is good praxis. Everyone in Lena Dunham's Girls is benefactored by their parents. The protagonist's dreams of being a shitty essayist are financed by her dorky suburban parents as she makes no money interning at Miu Miu. Her friend is a world traveler and another friend is literally Brian Williams' daughter outside of the show. Tao Lin's parents pay for him and his girlfriend to visit Taipei for several weeks and since both are carefree and wealthy, they're able to. Even Mir Gonzalez, who LARPs as an anti-capitalist, is the daughter of a pretty famous musician and published her first book of poetry at 21. The writings of the alt-lit and the progressive landscape in 2009 exuded privilege. Like, these people's children's children will go to elite colleges too once their parents' parents dropped the act and become hashtag resistance libs who work at, uh, at publishing houses. Alt-lit is an expression of new money classism. Also, doesn't the narcissism of thinking that people will want to read transcripts of what is essentially a bunch of boring shitty parties hint at a rich kid attitude as well? But it's one which will be validated until... <laughs> until... well... Post-irony essential to the alt-lit is a dialect which can only be expressed by the consistently carefree, 
when the consequence of being misunderstood is ending up at a restaurant you'd prefer not to be at. Simply, simply, if you're poor, then alt lit isn't for you. And I'm of the opinion that if something is not for you because you're poor, you should destroy it using the barbarism that the upper class has so graciously granted you. Anyways, I have a theory that the reason every alt-lit party is so miserable is because they're haunted. At the party, which was mostly people in their 30s and 40s, Paul asked Amy an open-ended question about her parents. When she began, after a pause to answer, he moved his phone from his pants pocket to his ear. Hello, he said in a clear voice and felt physically isolated like he was wearing a motorcycle helmet as he perpetually observed Amy moving her wine, almost spilling it to her mouth. Just kidding, said Paul. No one called me. Amy had a glassy, disoriented expression. I don't have a phone call, said Paul. That was good, said Amy, looking away. Just kidding, said Paul, grinning weakly. Alt-Lit isn't a literary movement made up of spectacularly talented people who rose the ranks, got published in journals, outshined their peers until finally becoming the voices of their generation. They're a collection of random assholes. This is kind of corny, but if you've been to an American high school, you'll have noticed that many of the most intelligent and creative students you meet are totally put off by the thought of going to college. I'm at an American university, and I haven't encountered nearly as many interesting people as I did then. The literary market has similarly... The literary market has similarly been made repulsive to nearly everyone who should be contributing to it. Through the elevation of middle-brow shit and the loss of literature as an interesting cultural force. For a gag, let's go back to the 1990s and try to imagine the circumstances which would lead to a similar alt-lit movement. Infinite Jest is too unwieldy to find a publisher, same for Underworld, it's too big. There's not an audience to justify translating the elementary particles. There's not an audience for French lit in the U.S. Arth authors like Sebald and Laszlo Krasd and Laszlo Krasna like Sabaud and Laszlo are obviously too experimental to even consider Den Dennis Johnson writes western jerk-off books self-published by Amazon Kathy Acker and Chris Krauss are both attacked by the intellectual dark web both are relegated to small press releases whose review pages get pillaged by frog bros the McSweeney's crew isn't embraced by the counterculture because they're hipster SJWs. The blog gets a few thousand hits a day and the physical releases are abandoned. Everyone else is too depressed to write anything, has no time left from working two jobs, is too discouraged from even trying to get published, is stuck in a state of heat and depression where the only media they engage with is League of Legends, etc. Thankfully... There is an alt-lit movement emerging for you to appreciate. Meet the 90s Tao Lin. His name is Jim Goad. Jim was a countercultural figure in the 90s who took issue with the stuffy way literature was written at the time and preferred to write informally about his life and thoughts. He was involved with other writers whose prose were indistinguishable from his own. Unlike Lin, he also complained a lot about so-called PC culture, but like Lynn, he abused his partners, at one point beating his girlfriend nearly to death and then leaving her to die in the desert. Also, when Goad was in jail, his friends rushed to his defense because he published them. The reason why Jim Goad isn't remembered today for his writing except by assholes is because he was too obscure to represent the time he was writing in, because he was kept in obscurity by better writers. Those better writers exist today, but they're not pushing cunts like Lynn into obscurity. They're working as janitors at an offices, or they are appreciated, but only by a small readership. There are writers today, though, who don't have a huge audience, but keep modern literature interesting. Gary J. Shipley, Reza Nigrestani, Sergio Di La Pava, Thomas Ligotti, the majority of what's published today by the big publishing houses is trash, but they don't sell that well. 
the market is in a pretty bad spot too. The culture is in crisis, and the counterculture is dead. This is all good news. There's a possibility that from this state, the people who should have made Tao Lin like Jim Goad can come up and create a literary movement worth more. If you want the future to remember your generation as more than what these fuckers represent, people aren't going to be reading your something awful post, they're going to be reading the literature of the period to understand who we were, what we felt. If you feel more than apathetic, if you want people to understand, read and write, write a narrator who has a lisp and have every S be a glob of spit set into the open grave of alt-lit. Start your own publishing houses. Write for the people who aren't reached by Penguin and Penguin Junior and Penguin England. Reclaim literature for the people. Keep the bastards out and tell the future that we were more.